afternoon. Good afternoon. Hi everyone, I'm Nicole Kaplan. I'm a 92 graduate of Washington University and a uh, grateful member of the Alumni Board of Governors. As you can infer from my virtual background, I am coming to you live from Florida today where yes, it is actually hot and sunny. But um, here on the Gold Coast, I serve on the regional cabinet and uh, chair the Elliott Society and volunteer with the Alumni and Parent Admissions Program. But today, um, on behalf of the WashU Alumni Association, I am very honored to welcome alumni, parents, students, and friends to this virtual event, Driven by Nature, Dr. Peter Raven's Journey in Botany and Global Sustainability. Uh, before we begin, just a programming note, um, you'll only hear and see me, our moderator, Dr. Shaw, and our speaker, Peter Raven. Um, luckily, really only Peter and, and Barbara, but we have a terrific list of submitted questions um, that Peter will address. And please feel free as we're you know, doing this to submit additional questions to the chat room. We'll go ahead and monitor them and you know, ask them as we go. Um, this webinar is being recorded and we'll share it on the Alumni Association's YouTube channel after we're done. Um, today we'll hear about Dr. Peter Raven's amazing book, Driven by Nature. Um, the book is a terrific combination of his life's work. We get to listen in on a wide ranging conversation as our nationally recognized plant evo evolutionary biologist, Dr. Barbara Schall, converses with Peter to give us a real behind the uh, scenes story of the book. Um, on a side note, I actually spent a ton of time at the Botanical Gardens while in school, really often hijacking a table for homework. So beyond the extraordinary research that Peter has accomplished, I'm very personally grateful for the environment um, as well. As many of you are probably um, aware, Dr. Shaw is a luminary in her own right. And one of the people at WashU that I have been really privileged to work with and, and for. Um, she has been president of the Botanical Society of America, president of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. She's an elected member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and the US National Academy of Sciences. She was a member of President Obama's Council of Advisors for Science and Technology. In 2004, she received the Wilbur Cross Medal from Yale University. And in 2019, she received the National Science Board's Public Service Medal. As many of us here today know her from 2013 through 2020, and this is obviously the role in which I admire her most, um, she served as Dean of the Faculty of Arts and Sciences and is currently the Mary Dell Chilton Distinguished Professor at Washington University. Um, so thank you very, very much, um, Dr. Shaw, for moderating today. And with that, it's all yours. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. It is such a pleasure to be part of this event with our extraordinary colleague, Dr. Peter Raven. And good afternoon to everyone out there in Zoom land. Um, now it's my great pleasure to introduce and welcome Dr. Peter Raven. Peter Raven is an extraordinarily, extraordinarily accomplished scientist, uh, administrator, and environmentalist. As president of the Missouri Botanical Garden, a position which he held for 40 years, he's made the garden one of the two greatest in the world. He nurtured the garden into a center for botanical research, for education of botany, plant science across the globe, public engagement um, with science and botany, and of course, horticultural display. And by developing the garden into its current form, a place, it's a place where St. Louisans and actually others from across the globe come to visit and to love the garden. Um, advocacy. Peter was declared a hero of the planet by Time Magazine. And it's really, you don't have to say too much more than that. That's just extraordinary. And of course it was very well deserved. He was declared a hero of the planet for his time, tireless and effective work on conservation of biodiversity. 
And this work has inspired so many scientists, so many students, and so many citizens to devote themselves to conservation efforts. His uh, scientific accomplishments may be less known to many of you, but he, with his friend and colleague, Paul Eric, published a series of paper that redirected the academic field, the scientific field of evolution. And they discovered and named um, code evolution, which is a reciprocal evolutionary process of species that are bound to each other, such as plants and their pollinators. He um, analyzed the distribution of plants globally and noticed that there were disjunctions, um, areas where, there, where, where a plant was not seen. Peter was able to show evidence of, plant, of plate tectonics at a time when the concept of moving tectonic plates was not widely accepted. He has served as president of so many scientific societies, the Botanical Society, the Society for Study of Evolution, the uh, uh, American Taxonomic Society, American Association for the Advancement of Science, Science I could go on and on. He served as Home Secretary for 12 years of the National Academy of Sciences. Um, he has many, many awards and honors, including multiple honorary degrees, as well as the United States National Medal of Science, which is the nation's highest honor for a scientist. Finally, at Wash U, Peter joined the Department of Biology in 1971, and two years later was appointed the George Engelman Professor of Botany, a position that had been created in 1884 and has been held by subsequent directors and presidents of the Missouri Botanical Garden for more than 130 years. He held this position until 2010, um, and. Uh, and then afterwards became emeritus. And while he was um, at, at the Botanical Garden, um, he chaired and co-chaired and served on the committee of some 30 Wash U PhD students in the Department of, Bi of Biology. Now as emeritus, he continues to encourage relationships between the university and the garden, and he interacts with both the biology department and the environmental um, undergraduate studies program at Wash U. And um, this uh, Wednesday, he's going to be visiting my class, and they're so excited. So please join me in welcoming, welcoming Dr. Peter Raven. Hi, thank you so much, Barbara, for that lovely introduction. It's a real pleasure to be here today, and uh, I enjoyed the opportunity to talk about my book, Driving by Nat Driven by Nature, which illuminates my life. My life has been a very, very happy one, and now at the age of 85, it's pleasant to look back on some of the extraordinary advantages that I have and some of the wonderful pleasures that I enjoyed along the way. I was born in Shanghai, China, but I, it would take far too long to explain why uh, for this program. I think you'll be more interested in my life later, but uh, sometimes when people ask me why I was born there, I just simply say, well, it's because my mother was there at the time I was born. And uh, I think we'll leave it at that today. The exciting details are in the book. <laughs> at the age of one in 1937, we moved back to California where we were basically from. And, uh, and uh, I had my first birthday on the boat. And by the end of that year, the Japanese had captured Shanghai. So it was an excellent year to move along and move back to California. Very interestingly, in San Francisco, we moved in at first with my grandparents who were living in a house that they had built uh, in 1915, in other words, uh, 22 years earlier, on the dunes uh, in the sun, in the uh, Richmond District of San Francisco. Before the earthquake and fire of 1906, the uh, western part of San Francisco is largely undeveloped, the part towards the bay, the part that gets the good healthy doses of fog every morning that we so delight in there. It does give you a lot of energy when it's always cold and damp, uh, unlike Florida, by the way. But then again, that makes us tough and resilient and to cherish life in an exciting way. At any event, uh, I, I grew up there for a while and um, 
When I was seven years old, I was home from school with the measles. Uh, that was before the age of people arguing about uh, uh, shots and inoculations, by the way, they were more interested in health than they were in politics, a strange thing. But at any rate, uh, I was in bed. You had to be out. If you got measles, you had to be out then for two weeks so you wouldn't affect the people back at school. And the second week tended to be boring. You tended to have uh, recovered and uh, be sitting in bed or sitting around the house with little to do. And it was at that point that my mother brought me a book called uh, Six Feet, not surprisingly, given the title about insects. And I looked at that book and uh, I began looking at the little stories about different kinds of insects, butterflies, like the cabbage butterflies that were in our backyard, uh, mosquitoes and what have you. And I was totally astonished. I had no idea that their lives were so complicated and so extraordinarily interesting. But the book set me straight on that. And when I got better, I not only went back to school, I rushed out into my backyard. Now, our house had been one of the first to be built on the dunes. It was on 12th Avenue between Anza and Balboa in San Francisco. Our house had been one of the first to be built on the dunes. And like all the houses out there, our sandy backyards were filled with the original denizens of the dunes like uh, Jerusalem crickets, which were very frightening looking bugs with uh, big stripy abdomens that look like they could bite you. And they could bite you. Cabbage butterflies, morning cloak butterflies, earwigs, and all sorts of insects that I could study and look at and marvel about and compare with what I had read in the book. After a year or so of that, one of my uncles discovered that at the California Academy of Sciences nearby in Golden Gate Park, it had moved there after the original one downtown had been destroyed in the earthquake and fire. Uh, only about uh, three blocks from my house, basically three, four blocks, uh, there was a student section. It was a group that welcomed young uh, kids, boys and girls who would uh, go there, not as a school class, but on their own volition and go to classes after school and uh, learn about not only insects, but uh, ecology and birds and lots of, uh, lots of other aspects of the life outside. And I learned a great deal there and it played a really important part in my life. And of course, that's one of the reasons that I've always been so enthusiastic about and supportive of not only the student programs in the M Missouri Botanical Garden, but also the similar programs in the Science Center, the Art Museum, the zoo, the um, Nature Center in University City and all the groups here that are fostering the same kind of activity. And in that connection, of course, I'm very proud to be able to mention that the garden has just opened a new entomology lab at our uh, butterfly house, our Sachs butterfly house in uh, Chesterfield. And uh, at that house, students can find the same sort of opportunities that uh, I did. I went on with that and uh, enjoyed it greatly. Um, Got, got to uh, attend classes there on Saturdays and during the week, got into high school, and uh, I went to an excellent high school, St. Ignatius in San Francisco. No biology was taught in high school then, but they had chemistry and physics. And later, when I went for my first two years to the University of San Francisco, similar to St. Louis U., um, I began to take biology and to learn about it in a more formal way. I didn't know at that time that there was an opportunity for professional life in the field of biology. Like many kids who are younger, I didn't really know what opportunities there were for careers. We had no scientists in my, my family. And um, so as I went on there, I had the good fortune to meet a series of extraordinary mentors in California. Uh, 
uh, John Thomas Howell and Alice Eastwood at the California Academy of Sciences Botany Department, I got to know through the student section. Ledyard Stebbins, who was perhaps the foremost evolutionary biologist of the 20, of plants of the 20th century, I got to know through a Sierra Club base camp outing that I attended when I was 14 years old. Edgar Anderson, who was a brilliant scientist based here at the Missouri Botanical Garden, I got to know because of his, during his visits to California with Stebbins. And, if, and when I transferred to the University of California, Berkeley as a junior, then with a botany major and all, the field began to really open up for me. And I met many other people. During my early botanical expeditions, largely on behalf of the California Academy, I discovered a, an unnamed species of Clarkia, the genus Clarkia, Godetia's garden flowers, but a small flowered one on serpentine in the Presidio of San Francisco. And a specimen of mine was put into the herbarium, the collection of dried plants at the California Sciences, and it was found there by Harlan Lewis, a well-known, really good evolutionary biologist of plants at UCLA. Uh, he found it in the collections at the academy and contacted me. And then he and his wife, Margaret, who were collaborating on that group of plants, wanted to get seeds of mine to uh, be able to grow and cross with and compare with other species of the same group. Um, I eventually found the seeds for them. They were grown at UCLA and Harlan invited me down there in the summer of 1956 when I was 20 years old to look at the results of those to hybridize them and to join in the investigation of the genetics and the relationships of the species that I had found. Along the way, I realized that by attending graduate school, I could qualify myself for a professional career in botany so that what I thought of first as something that would be purely an avocation could be a full-time activity. I went to UCLA full-time in 1957, 21 years old, and graduated in 1960 with my PhD went on a postdoctoral to the uh, British Museum of Natural History in London and Kew Gardens, the Royal Botanic Gardens, and um, studied the group of plants that my Clarkia had belonged to in their wonderful collections there in London. And of course, broadened my sights a great deal. In uh, while I was a graduate student, I married my childhood sweetheart, Sally Barrett, who had been a member of the student section. And before I graduated from UCLA, I, we had a child. So that little baby Alice came with us to London. Um, returning to California, I worked for a year at the Rancho's, what was then the Rancho Santa Ana Botanical Garden near Los Angeles then joined the faculty at Stanford University. And it was there that I met distinguished colleagues, Paul Ehrlich, Richard Holm, John Hunter Thomas, and so forth, and really began to broaden my sights in biology. As Washington University does now, but relatively forward for their time, Stanford had had since the 1930s a Department of Biological Sciences instead of separate departments in various areas uh, so that one could gain in a very broad view of biology. And if you were studying a supposedly uninteresting field like plant evolution or plant systematics, you had to prove to your colleagues in molecular biology then in its ascendant heyday, why what you were doing was worth five minutes of time. That helped a lot in polishing your arguments. 
During our studies there, Paul Ehrlich and I studying butterflies, which was his specialty, plants, which were mine, uh, realized that they engaged in a sort of chemical warfare with the plants manufacturing certain chemicals and then the butterflies not being able to not being able to feed on them and then gradually over the course of millions of years gaining the opportunity to feed on them producing whole new groups of butterflies on them and uh, then they lost their selective advantage although the many other kinds of butterflies and i'm talking here about the caterpillars of butterflies what they would eat would move in and find whole new vacancies. And we called the process coevolution. Early on, I got very interested in the flora of North America, a flora of the United, an account of all the plants of the United States and Canada, uh, which was um, uh, modeled after or inspired by the flora of Europe, which had finished up pretty much in the early part of my time at Stanford. In um, 1969, uh, I went on a postdoctoral to New Zealand and there uh, began to understand why continental movement, plate tectonics was the mechanism by which the continents moved. Continental movement provided a basis for understanding much better than had been the case before the distribution of plants and animals. To give you a simple example, New Zealand along with New Caledonia and the other plants along that ridge had separated from the coast of Australia about 80 million years earlier and it carried with them the lowland forest of New Zealand and New Caledonia, which was very rich in relic trees and so forth. But the elevation of New Zealand later produced the upland habitats, which then received the upland plants and animals blowing over in the prevailing westerlies from Australia. Coming back for a year at Stanford, I was recruited by I was recruited by um, the Missouri Botanical Garden, which was an organization that I'd gotten to know during my time working on the early earliest stages of the flora of North America. And in being recruited by them, I was recruited really as a scientist. I had had no earlier experience in administration or fundraising. The man who interviewed me was George Paik, who, who was an IBM executive who'd gone out to San Jose, California to found uh, Silicon Valley, in other words, to found a uh, center there, a research center for IBM. And in doing so, he had been near to me at Stanford, so he'd interviewed me. But as Barbara mentioned, in 1884, the garden opened by, in 1859, I should say, and was largely a display garden as Henry Shaw envisioned it. But by, um, but Henry Shaw always had the idea of having research there too. And George Engelman, who was a early German immigrant to St. Louis and really responsible for many of the foundations of the fundamentals of science in the Middle West, uh, George Engelman, botanist, Engelman spruce in the Rocky Mountains is named for him. He was a specialist on conifers like the spruce and on cacti. He was Henry Shaw's botanical advisor. In 1884, Henry Shaw um, established a school of botany at Washington University uh, and in doing so, brought the garden and Washington University together, and they've stayed together ever since. The position that he endowed uh, on Engelman's death about two years later is called the Engelman Professorship. So the director of the garden has always been expected from that time onward to be a professor at Washington University and also a director of the garden. Uh, and that was the case for me. 
uh, and I, I played both roles as best I could. But as I said, I was hard, hired largely because of my uh, scientific uh, uh, success up to that time. And the fact that I could learn to manage the uh, um, administration and the uh, fundraising at the garden was really a lucky break for the trustees because they had no reason to think that I could or couldn't do that when they hired me. As the years went by at the garden, it became more and more obvious that species were becoming extinct worldwide. Uh, just before I left Stanford, it had become obvious that biological species, plants and animals were becoming extinct in larger and larger numbers. And by the end of the 70s, my first decade at the garden, that was for and although the garden had had a research program from the time Henry Shaw passed away in 1889 until uh, uh, the time I got there in 1971. And that research program had developed in the United States and to a certain extent in other areas by field trips. The garden had never really had a permanent interest in the plants of other areas and I knew that we should, particularly in view of the rapid extinction, and began to hire people and spread our program southward into uh, Latin America. We were working on an account of the plants of Panama, so it seemed logical to begin working in Colombia. And we followed up by stationing people in Peru, Ecuador, Bolivia, and uh, other countries around the world, and very importantly, with an early program in Madagascar, a fascinating island off the east coast of Africa. And soon the garden had a worldwide research program with about 50 scientists and growing gradually towards a staff of about 500 people. Uh, it became, we were able to become a worldwide force in the field of exploration like um, the New York Botanical Garden and Kew, which were then the nearest uh, similar institutions. And as we made a difference all over the world, we did our best to affect conservation. I went on personally becoming a, a very much of an activist in the area of conservation. And my talk in the AAAS meeting in 1985 was one of the first big outreach talks that spoke about the rapid disappearance of tropical forests. Uh, since 1985, of course, in the last 30 or 40 years, everyone has become concerned about the loss of species and global climate change so that unless we address global climate change carefully, we will never be able to address the loss of species. And furthermore, those happy scenes in Florida will be enjoyed by fishes rather than by people. And of course, it doesn't stop. The atmosphere gets more and more of the gases in it that trap the heat of the sun under the atmosphere and as it does that, the sea level rises and the climate becomes warmer and warmer. Uh, that is something that we're really dealing with very, very inadequately. Since 1990, I've been very active in the Pontifical Academy of Sciences, which is the scientific advisory body of the Catholic Church, which doesn't deal with matters of faith and morals, but matters of science. It's the only religious organization in the world that has such a body. And in raising uh, uh, volumes of scientific information, we're able to help the Pope to take principled and scientifically based uh, views on many issues, uh, including evolution in the 1930s and uh, of course climate change famously in his uh, in in his uh, insectical 
in his encyclical official papal letter, Laudato Si, which I would encourage you all to write. That's very influential. He and, and uh, Patriarch Bartholomew II of the uh, Eastern Orthodox Church have been very outspoken in the need for, as a matter of social justice, uh, people to take care of uh, climate change, which so unfairly affects the poor and so unfairly affects the whole world. Obviously, under the influence of Paul and Ann Ehrlich at Stanford, I realized very early how important population was in the whole mixture. The global population has grown from approximately um, 250 billion, uh, sorry, 2.5 billion people when I was born in the mid 30s to 6.8 billion people at the, pre uh, sorry, 7.8 billion people at the present time. And uh, it's estimated by scientists who study the matter that the carrying capacity of the earth is around 1.5 to 2.5 billion people. Uh, Global Footprint Network, which I'd urge you all to look up on the web, uh, estimates that with the present population of 7.8 billion people, we're collectively using about 175% of all that the world can offer on a sustainable basis. And of course, our outdated economies largely assume that if you use more of it, it'll produce more. And that's true of labor, for example, but it's certainly not true of natural productivity so we're grinding the world down very rapidly. And as we grind it down, uh, we wonder where it's all leading. If we can't find enough willpower to slow down population growth and get inside a population that can endure, and if we can't find enough energy to stop global warming, uh, there'll be a lot more things to worry about than beachfront properties at Florida being underwater. The kind of agriculture that's practiced in California uh, in 10 years is no longer be possible there. The climate in uh, Missouri in uh, 10 years about like the climate of Northern Georgia now. And we can only hope that the conference coming up uh, on, on climate change will to address the matter in a serious way. Nations, however, are motivated by greed. It seems very difficult for them to do anything about it. And we carry on in our own way, in a way that uh, may be comfortable in the very short run as we involve ourselves in daily matters, but not in the long run. The, the billionaires in the world, about 2,000 of them, have about as much money as the 4.6 billion poorest people in the world. And the concentration of wealth in a very few hands is just one of the things that drives social justice and particularly makes it possible for the poorer nations of the world to reach any kind of stability or proper development. So there we are. I think that uh, I've covered enough and you can see why I became so interested in being outspoken about these matters. It's simply because it's so essential for our own future. I've enjoyed such a wonderful life myself that I would like my children and grandchildren, the youngest of whom will not be my age until the year 2202 to enjoy a life uh, nearly as good or as close as possible to the life that I have. That will require many, many adjustments, uh, lowering the amount of individual consumption, empowering women throughout the world, and taking many steps that may be difficult but will be essential if we're to reach a kind of a stability in the future. Association between Washington University and the Garden uh, 140 years old, basically, has been a wonderful one. 
my particular association with Barbara Shaw, we've co-chaired a number of PhD committees has been super, and uh, I hope it goes on far into the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Peter. That was terrific as always. Um, now what we're going to do is um, to go through some of the questions that you all submitted during registration. If you have any subsequent questions, um, please put them in the chat and hopefully we can get to them. Um, although there was a lot of vigorous questions posed um, already. So I'm gonna begin with uh, the first one, obviously. And uh, this is, uh, a, I think, a very interesting question. Peter, why did you choose to write Driven by Nature? I wanted to cover really two things to kind of document the change in my life from, well, three reasons, actually. Document the change in my life from uh, uh, a so-called pure scientist, somebody who would concentrate primarily or almost exclusively on the development of scientific theories and scientific information to an outspoken uh, advocate of world stability at a time when that was needed. And by doing so, to try to help inspire academics in general to share their knowledge with the world the incredible ignorance being displayed by governments all over the world, not only ours, but many others about science, which after all, merely tries to refine the best facts we have into a form where they can be useful to us uh, is appalling and at the same time challenging. Uh, secondly, um, I wanted to show how in my life I had basically neglected my own family and personal affairs in a sort of a total drive for science. And that had not been really very satisfactory. And scientists are really faced with that. The lust for doing that overwhelming for reaching success in science particularly depending on our personalities and how we were brought up and all, I forget all the other good things in life, it's hoping that some other people might escape the mistakes that I had made along the way. And finally, I wanted to afford a model for young children to be interested in science, to find the kind of that I had to look around outside and be bewitched and enthralled by the beauty of life there and there and in loving it, want to preserve it. Great. Thank you. Um, so next question. Can you talk about what roles organizations like Botanical Gardens, the Sierra Club and others play in inspiring and empowering people to act on environmental and climate issues? Uh, a very big uh, issue. I. Personally, it's kind of interesting. I've been a member of the Sierra Club for, uh, well, since I was 12 years old, in other words, for 73 years. I think that I may, I'm either the first or second longest standing member of the Sierra Club. When I joined it, it was mostly an outdoor recreational club, although it had been inspired by John Muir and certainly had a conservation background based on his first fighting for the preservation of Hetch Hetchy Valley. Now, conservation organizations, well, uh, it, two different answers. Organizations that have standing exhibits like the Garden, the Science Center, the zoo, and so forth can inspire people to conservation by providing evidence and information right there among their exhibits and also in their children's and adult classes to become active in those fields. Organizations like the Nature Conservancy, the World Wildlife Fund, which are active all over the world, can also inspire people to think about conservation and in thinking about it, do something about it. And uh, of course, many organizations in the biodiversity rich, largely tropical, less developed countries themselves can be very important in organizing. I should say, however, that several factors I mentioned before, and we'll just list now, uh, social injustice, the 
enormous control of wealth in a few countries and by a few people and by rich people, even within poor countries all over the world has to be overcome if we're gonna act collectively in a serious and substantial way to preserve the world and its stability. Uh, we need to reach a lower population, difficult as that may be. We need to get out of outmoded economics where every time we don't have enough children in some country, some stupid article in a newspaper says, oh, they're looking at economic peril. Well, what do they think that we're gonna live in economic happiness until we're all standing shoulder to shoulder and then presumably we'll have it hard to move our arms to keep living in economic happiness. We can't have economy always based on more and more people. It simply is impossible for the world in which we live and which as I say, the Global Footprint Network recognize, uh, calculates that we're using about 175% of what's there in terms of sustainability already. And the right of women, about a, a billion of which women and children have no rights at all, has to be recognized if we're going to make sensible decisions about a lot of these things, not only in the poorer countries of the world, but around the world. We have no chance of achieving global sustainability unless we become more international in an outlook. Making America great again is simply a way of saying we're going to be as greedy as possible and pretend we're on an island floating around somewhere in the sky. We can simply grab as much as it can from everybody else. Uh, if everybody lived the way we live in the United States, consuming as much as we do, if everybody in the world, the 7.8 billion of us live that way, it re would require between four and five copies of the planet Earth to support us. So guess what? It's not going to happen. And airy fairy dreams of floating off into space and so forth are not going to happen either. Let's get serious about the one we have here and work hard individually, collectively, and encourage our governments to find ways to save it. Um Another question, what group of plants are most threatened by climate change? And are we seeing the effects of global warming on Midwestern flora right now? Uh, the plants that are, some of the plants that are most threatened by global climate change obviously are the ones on tops of mountains because the, the habitats that are on tops of the mountains uh, uh, are just not going to be where they are now and leaping from mountain to mountain not going to be easy. Um, pikas, those conies, those wonderful little animals that squeak their way around the tops of the United States, there's going to be no habitat for them in the United States and they have really no way of leaping from mountain to mountain. Anything on mountain top, anything on the edge of any climate um, as the currents offshore warm, Mediterranean climates, summer dry climates are going to be uh, ruined. The southern ends of the southern continents, which have cool adapted plants on them, are going to become warm and the whole array of plants along, the, which is one of the most marvelous in the world along the south coast of South America, Australia and South Africa, are endangered. In the Midwest, uh, many rare plants are going to be endangered as their habitats become increasingly different from what they are now. As I already pointed out, uh, our calculations indicate that within 10 years or so, uh, it's going to be hardly possible to cultivate soybeans or corn in the Midwest. Uh, our climate will be like more like that of northern Georgia now. And as it keeps changing, we gradually lose not only our ability to cultivate, but our ability to preserve our native flora. Um, another question. I would love to hear Dr. Raven's thoughts and hopes read the role of ecological restoration in helping one, the plant communities themselves, and two, the human community relate to the natural world in a way that will encourage them to, to care for and preserve it. 
um, ecological restoration is very important, first of all, in building and simplest in building livable habitats in and around cities. We ought to be aware of our vegetation there. We ought to be aware of what we can grow. We ought to make our living spaces as beautiful as we can. Ecological restoration in areas that have been logged off while wood was an important source of fuel, a very important source of fuel up until about 1830, 1850, restoring them is very good, not only in terms of uh, uh, saving the soil and moderating the climate, but uh, moderating the climate indirectly, but also in moderating the climate by storing the carbon dioxide. That's one of the major greenhouse gases in which plants take up and fix in their bodies, in themselves and in the wood to, uh, uh, as they build their own bodies. And of course that will help with uh, global warming as well. And restoration of all kinds of communities with perhaps with uh, varieties of the plants that are more suited to somewhat warmer habitats is gonna be something we're gonna be forced to do as our habitats gradually become warmer in the future. And I should say that the gases that are getting into the atmosphere and are causing our climates to become warmer don't come out of the atmosphere easily. It'll be uh, two, three, four thousand years before the atmosphere can adjust itself back to normal. So we're really setting ourselves on a course that if intelligence guided politics, we would long since have abandoned. Um, you stated uh, that your, uh, you started your environmental efforts at a young age. Can you share your thoughts about the current generation of young environmental leaders and what they face today? Well, I think young environmental leaders, uh, young people today uh, are, tend to be scared and upset by what's going on in the world. And the first thing they have to do is overcome that because and what you have to realize, I think, to overcome that is that although we may be headed for some kind of overall global crash, and unless we suddenly find intelligent ways to deal with governments that are basically bought off by rich people who want to keep things going as they are and by corporations, unless we find some way to move beyond that, uh, we are going to face some kind of crash, and it's going to be sooner than later. But every single thing we do, whether it's recycling, whether it's moderating our own consumption, whether it's influencing the city of St. Louis or the St. Louis metro area, the St. Louis County to live more sustainably, to get away from fuels that are driving global warming, coal, oil, and so forth. Uh, by encouraging our governments to take a more international outlook and to realize that we depend on nations all over the world for our survival, that those steps will be of enormous importance in moderating and ameliorating the level of the crash that we may be facing, that we are likely to be facing. Things can be better. Uh, you know, as I, as I quote from science fiction at the end of my book, if you look, people looking back in 100 years in Ray Bradbury's book say, I guess uh, they were either too dumb or too cheap to do anything about it. And we don't want to be in the position of being too dumb or too cheap to do anything about it. And youth can, can inspire us to do better, need to inspire us to do better for their own good and even for our good. And it's a matter of social justice. It's a matter of morality. It's a matter of what it means to really be alive. And so let's get on with it and let's make things as good as they could possibly be and not sit around wringing our hands and saying, oh my heavens, we're facing such an awful time that it's impossible, we're trapped. Um, and in that vein, um... What are your thoughts about Edward O. Wilson's half-Earth recommendations? 
Well, Edward Wilson's uh, half earth recommendation, which encourages reforestation and saving natural vegetation all over the world, uh, which advocates putting aside half of the earth in conservation and which the uh, conservation um, authorities in the world are trying to get it up to 30% right now is obviously a good step from a number of point of views, from the point of view of climate change and from the point of view of biodiversity uh, preservation. Um, obviously in that, uh, it will be very important to save those areas that have the most species in them as part of the half earth. In other words, they're only about, um, what do we say? There are about 15,000 species of plants native to the United States and Canada, uh, something like 5, 000, uh, five to 6,000 in Canada. And of those, there are probably only something like, it's something like 50 that are found only in Canada. And so obviously it makes a difference whether you're talking about preserving the um, boreal forests, all the huge forests in Canada, which is very valuable and very important from climatic and from a number of points and to say nothing of indigenous people, saving them is very important, but it's not a big step in saving biodiversity comparing with say, saving the country of Peru, which probably has, uh, well, which certainly has at least three, three and a half times as many species as there are in the US and Canada combined in an area about four times the size of Texas. Uh, so we wanna make good choices in doing it too but it will be a very good idea to set our goals as high as we can and to pursue them as strongly as we can. Um, we have many more questions, but only time for one more. So this is the last question. Um, what current projects are you and your wife most involved in? Where are the most species being saved and how can we accelerate what seems to be a very slow process of saving species? That's actually more than one question. Well, when it comes to plants, um, putting aside their seeds in seed banks is the most valuable thing we can do. Seed banks are low temperature, low humidity storage units. And actually of what we estimate is about 140, I mean, sorry, about 450,000 kinds of plants. About a third of them are already preserved as seeds. The uh, conservation is going on most strongly in areas like California, which has about 2,500 species found nowhere else in Europe and uh, to some extent in China and uh, their individual, Australia, their individual countries that are making a good job of it. Um, the question was, uh, read me, tell me another couple of the lobes of that question. Um, how can, uh, well, what current projects are you and your wife most involved in? Oh, most involved in writing and trying to inspire people to do better in conservation and exploring the remnants of the world's plants and animals while they're still there so that we can deal with them intelligently. But mostly now in writing and in trying to document some of the things that uh, stand in our archives from the past. So there was one other point to this question, just how can we accelerate what seems to be such a slow process of saving species? Is there any way to increase the rate of, of, of saving species? Or is that something that's just by, by definition going to be constant because of the seed storage, et cetera? Yeah, well, that and, and, in, and in the general way, the points that I made earlier promote strongly as possible internationalism in a country like the United States go abroad, learn about how other people are living, try to build up their lives, make them more stable, uh, empower women, uh, and uh, just work on the many points that I've made earlier in the, in the talk. Right. Well, with that, um, I think we have reached the time that we should switch it over to Nicole. So Nicole, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Uh, thank you. Um, 
So obviously I would like to thank both Peter and, and Barbara for today's amazing event. Um, and just thank you for letting me participate and you know be part of this amazing conversation. Um, for the guests, thank you again for joining today's event. Please join us for more virtual events um, in the future. And you can find the updated opportunities on the alumni. Um, website, which uh, will be posted into the chat. So again, thank you and have an amazing evening.